So uh, Furman Garcia and I think Lewis uh, are yet to give their talks and I thought I'll set, set it up and coordinate with them to show you some new information that we are only now digitizing to present to the world and that's really to deal with anatomy. So these are the, so the strategies for outflow VT like the case you saw today is assess the indication, look at 12 lead, assess physiologic impact. Why do we ablate? We ablate if we think there's going to be cardiomyopathy or symptoms, right? And uh, the whole strategy, this is where electrograms, anatomy, and catheter ablation all come together. And we've learned over the years that PVC ablation sometimes could be among the more challenging and complex ablations that you may actually do in clinical practice. So let's talk about anatomic concepts. And one of the things that I was going to share with the audience, and this is the first time we are presenting this in a formal forum, is the McAlpine collection. So many of us and some of the older cardiologists would know that in the 1970s, there was a very important book that was published on cardiac anatomy by a cardiac surgeon. <coughs> so Wallace McAlpine spent 20 years, he collected about a thousand human hearts and 600 animal hearts, pressure perfused them, and created one of the most useful atlases. Now it was printed as a large atlas, and as it turns out, the original collection was actually misplaced for 30 years. Uh, it took us about four years to discover the collection, and now we actually got the original images and we digitized them, and it actually shows how brilliant the collection is because even the McAlpine Atlas had a slightly yellow tinge to those pictures. That is because in the 1970s, we even talked to the press in Germany that printed it. That was the most advanced printing press in the world, like many things Germans do. And subsequently, it's taken over Asia. That was one of those things where now everything that's printed or done elsewhere. But at that time, Germany was also the printing center of the world. Uh, and apparently, technology now has improved so much that digital printing was not available and that's why the colored with yellow. <laughs> so uh, this is that famous book and as you can see uh, it is one of the most remarkable uh, atlases ever. Each one of those images can take uh, hours to just appreciate because it's more like art. And of course uh, this collection was sitting in a corner of the Cleveland Clinic's library and one of their librarians who was about to retire located this collection and they said oh there are a bunch of slides lying out there and they were kept in a shelf and they were about to get rid of it. When Bruce Lytle, just before he retired, uh, told me the history of how they acquired the collection and he actually helped me and dealt with the other guys and we acquired the collection from them because the family gave us the rights to it and we discovered that it was sitting in that library because when Dr. McAlpine retired, he had given it to Cleveland Clinic and went off to Florida and he retired. <laughs> So this is one of those interesting inside stories. When this atlas was released, I'd like to again show that you know it received a gold medal in Leipzig. One of the reviewers said this is an original work that may be equal but will be difficult to surpass. It's no ordinary atlas, it's a work of art. <coughs> All of us in electrophysiology look for anatomic images and it's only after seeing this image and set of images I can say that we've become different electrophysiologists. Herman Garcia would tell you that uh, it is life before McAlpine and life after McAlpine is kind of how we look at this. Some people who have done enough cases, of course, understand how this works. And in those days, things were not any different. Dr. McAlpine actually had to spend money out of his own pockets. And much like what we did at UCLA, one of the grateful patients donated money so that we could actually get this collection done. This is Dr. McAlpine. This is their family gave me a picture of him, he converted the entire basement of his house into a pathology lab and he took these pictures mounting these hearts on a special apparatus. And what was most remarkable about the way he did this atlas was he was a cardiac surgeon who used to cap his own patients in Toledo, Ohio. So he was the first anatomist who actually did attitudinal anatomy of the heart, RAO, LAO, how the heart sits in the chest. If you look at all other anatomy books, the hearts are all squishy, they are not because it's not plasticine pressure perfused. He actually took these hearts and put them on a heart lung machine and put plasticine so that it looks as if it's in life. And that's, that shows remarkable vision. And since he used to cap his own patients, that's why his anatomy specimens are so relevant. And it's going to be for time immemorial because 
If you look at CTs and MRIs, they don't do attitudinal anatomy of the heart. <clears throat> in fact, all the software is not even set up to do it. If you have to go through many steps to do that. So, uh, this is one of my favorite images, McAlpine himself, looking at his atlas and putting in the slides. So, coming back to the first slide, which I told you, the relationship of the sinuses and the aorta. So, the crisp crossing of the two great arteries is an important concept. Point to be made about this slide, the RVOT is to the left of the LVOT, vast portions of it. That's important to keep in mind. So, that is the reason why the electrocardiography, all of this follows the same rules. So, now let's look at the relationship with the aortic sinuses. If you cut open the RV and you look at it with the free wall, and this is the pulmonic valve on this side, this is the right aortic sinus, this is the RCA, and this is the right left junction exactly where my arrow sits. And now, when you cut open the RV, in this case, we're going to cut open the RV right here. And if you look behind it, you see the aorta. And this is one of those dissections which is so artistically done. If you look carefully at this image, we can go for hours. And later, there's, I think, Furman is going to show in his talk. He has the exact same image which we gave to him of showing the moderator band and how you can actually map and ablate BTs that come from that. So this is the right-left junction over here. And this is the relationship. So these two regions are completely intertwined. And indeed, there have been instances where people have carelessly ablated in the RVOT and it can damage the coronary arteries. <coughs> so this is the double power injection, which I just showed a few minutes ago. And there are 14 sites from which VTs can originate in the outflow tracks. Fortunately, some of these sites are uncommon. But some common sites are any region of the RVOT, the right-left junction, and the left cusp. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's a power injection in the aorta, and in this case, we have a catheter in the RVOT turned on itself. This highlights both the RAO and the LAO view, the angles, and it's important to remember the RVOT wraps around the aorta as it moves leftward. All these facts matter a lot during mapping. Here's again an LAO view, and in this case, this is the PA, this is the aorta, and this is the tricuspid valve just with the free wall of the RV removed. And if you continue with this vision where the RV is now removed and you look at it in the RAO view, you can see where the left main runs, and this is the attachment of the RV. Again, the intervalvular trigone, this is the right left junction. Looking at it a little more carefully, you can now see this in the LAO view. In this case, this dissection is so beautiful. Just the bases of the pulmonic valve alone have been maintained. Just to show you the orientation of how the pulmonic valve sits in relation to the aortic valve. So this is very important to keep in mind. It also has, we are in a pediatric hospital, it also has a lot of implications for pulmonic valve replacement. If you were to uh, play, replace a pulmonic valve with a prosthesis in a child, this is very distensible. You can actually compress the left main. So one of the reasons why if you go to a pediatric lab, they always do a test inflammation of the pulmonary artery while injecting the left coronary artery to make sure that you don't compress the coronary artery. <coughs> the same concept is being highlighted here. It's a higher resolution. And let me move to the next image. So this is the superior view showing the right ventricles attachment, highlighting the fact that what you don't see in this image in the superior area is the part of the RVOT that overlies the aorta. And this area, the right-left junction, is a common reason for ablation, which this sometimes requires ablation from both sides, whereas the right cusp, the right cusp really there's no part of the right cusp that cannot be approached from the right side. It's just you need to know how to curve the catheter backwards. Sometimes you may actually have to go from the right IJ so that you have a better access to that area. So if you split open the RV again, this is the views that you see. And we already talked about how this muscle, this is the exact area that Furman was ablating. This uh, cross-section also shows other important structures, such as the posterior superior process of the RV, of the LV. And this is one of the reasons why sometimes you can ablate left ventricular tachycardia from the right atrium. So sometimes basal ventricular tachycardias, you can actually ablate from the right atrium based on anatomy. 
So let me just uh, switch to this. This is uh, again an additional view showing you the pulmonic valve, the aorta and the relationship between the left main. And this area we are soon going to learn, this is the, the famous Bermuda Triangle of the heart, the LV ostium, the tricky region and a difficult region where it's hard to track and ablate the VTs. So again, in this particular image, you can see how if you put in a pulmonic prosthesis, you could easily compress the left main coronary uh, and the proximal LAD system if you're not careful. So this is a fluoroscopic orientation. In this case, we have two catheters, one here in the aorta, two ablation catheters, one in the RPOT, and this is the exact mapping of the right-left junction. Again, to highlight the relationship between the two areas, and it's about micro mapping and having a lot of patients in a case that is the difference between success and a repeat procedure so uh, we actually looked at this in a structured way where we use the aorta as the orientation so another problem that you see in pathology textbooks is pathologists just cut the heart the way they want just to identify structures whereas we in the world of cardiology electrophysiology we have to live with the catheter and we have to view the anatomy as to how the catheter views the heart. So if you use the aorta as an axis and you do cross-sectional work both with CT and with uh, uh, anatomic specimens which I'm going to show you, you can actually study the relationship at all these levels between the muscle that surrounds the aortic root and the actual aorta itself. So we did this interesting study, this was done by Marma Vsegi many years ago and finally we are putting together the manuscript. It's one of those papers where we were so busy doing other things we never had the time to properly write it up. So what we did is we used different colored dyes to put within the aortic sinuses and did a series of cross sections and histologically looked at what the muscle does, especially over the right coronary sinus. And when you looked at this region of the RVOT, you find that the muscle thickness is about four millimeters, four to six millimeters. That is the RVOT muscle that overlies the right aortic sinus. So almost always, there's no reason to ablate within the right cusp. And this is histology. So if you're ablating within the aorta, you're burning through the aortic wall to get to the structure. So file that away in the back of your mind as to how the procedure is done. So we also quantified this and the details of that is not quite that important. But I'll just highlight showing that sometimes when you map, this is the right uh, cusp and this is exactly where you ablate. And in this case, the ablation catheter is from the IJ. And this was actually a paper that was published by Dr. Narsim and showing the face map and the location. And this is the exact point where uh, Furman is ablating today, which is the area that overlaps the right cusp. So, then let's switch gears and I wanted to sort of set up the other two talks and coming to the tail end of my presentation and that is this is another fascinating dissection where the coronary arteries and the coronary veins have been removed from the specimen. So now you can look at the relationship between the PA and the aorta. This is the left main. This is the mitral orifice. This is the tricuspid. And if you look at this particular region, that is a part of the LV osteum which is very tough to avoid. Some of this also overlaps with the so-called aortomitral continuity VTs. And this area is a huge technical challenge for ablation. And if you were to sort of overlay the structures, this gives you a rough orientation of what you're looking at. So this area is a very tricky, tough area to ablate. And this is the, the so-called LV osteum. And Furman is going to be addressing this too in great detail. So to recap, anatomy over here, this is the aortic root, this is really the LV ostium in from the big picture, and this particular region is the posterior superior process of the LV. This is the tricuspid valve, and of course this is the center of the heart, this is the non-coronary cusp, and this of course is related to both atria, and you can ablate atrial tachycardias from there, and you can also ablate accessory pathways, which can insert in the, especially the atrial insertion site, of some mid septal pathways. So more views of the LV ostium. This is the left main and this is the osteal region. And this is yet another view with aortic illumination showing you the aortomitral intervalvular fibrosis seen over here. That's why when people say aortomitral continuity, what they are referring to is muscle that comes in this area. The actual aortomitral continuity has no muscle at all. 
So it's the technical term for it is aortomitral intervalvular fibrosis. It's also another reason why you have to be incredibly careful during cardiac surgery because you can easily have dehiscence in that area, especially when you're suturing in a valve prosthesis. So this is uh, another view in this case more posteriorly just where the aorta has been cut out and the PA has been left intact to show you the relationship between how the PA branch just roofs over the, the atrium. Some of you may recognize these images. This is one of those beautiful dissections where the mitral valve and the aortic valve are going to be cut out of the specimen and taken out so that you can look at the LV osteo, which is shown right here. Do you see the cut edge over here? And when you remove those two valves, and it really requires only a surgeon could have done this so artistically. What you see over here, this is the AV osteum. And this is the area where the artery to the AV node runs. This is the pins that he has put in over there to show to us. So this is, of course, the figure that was made popular by Neil Kay's publication. He actually took the old image, which was not that well reproduced. And here you can see this in its brilliance of how the entire LV osteum looks like. So either way, I'll uh, stop here and uh, just make one little comment, and that is LV osteum is a very tricky region because the muscle over there is more than a centimeter thick. Sometimes it's 15 to 16 millimeters thick, and it also has a lot of epicardial fat. So the access to that area is a big problem, which is one of the reasons why LV osteal VT ablation continues to be a big challenge. And this actually shows how a catheter can potentially approach. And you can see that the distance through which you're mapping is much, much higher. So my plan here was to just stop and uh, later, if time permits, we can actually, uh, if others coming up, Alhambra, we'll go back to the lab or how does this work? Okay, so uh, in that case, maybe Lewis can, uh, so, So we'll I'll switch so that someone can see. Maybe one other video just for people who are thinking on the way to actually see it. Uh, this we have discussed before. This is just an image here to show you how the catheters look within the heart. And indeed, there are some cases where VTs originate, and the earliest signal you can record is within the left main. And in some of these cases, if you map very carefully, you may be able to ablate this from the RVOT. So that's important to remember. So this is to orient the audience here. This is the epicardial catheter. This is within the coronary veins. There are two arterial sticks. And this is uh, an LV mapping. So the three-dimensionality of anatomy in this region is very important. But I think it's worth the effort because many of these patients who end up uh, getting these procedures, uh, and if you have a good indication, it's very uh, gratifying to see EF improve and Patients generally do very well after these procedures. So um, I'll switch now and maybe Lewis can present and we can finish up. You ready, Lewis? Is Furman here? So we can. So you want to give the audience a five-minute coffee break? They have to sit through that. Let's do that. Thank you so much.